In this week's video, I'm refinishing and restyling this occasional table. I found this table in a barn at an estate sale. The owner said they'd used it a couple years ago in their daughter's room, but stored it in the barn since then. Structurally, it was in good shape and was made of solid oak, but it was covered with dirt and smelled like a barn. The doors were painted shut. As you can see, I had already tried to wipe some of the dirt off, but I think I just smeared it around even more. Believe it or not, I was thrilled to find this because it was just what I'd been looking for to try a new restyling technique. I have big plans for this lowly little table. Watch the video to see if it turned out as planned or was a total bust. I was finally able to get the doors open, so I got to work scrubbing the table and removing the stickers. I used copious amounts of crud cutter, a plastic scrubby, and a wire brush to clean it as best I could. This must have been painted with latex paint because I found it began to peel off when I used the wire brush and crud cutter. That's why I don't paint furniture with latex paint. I've found that it sometimes just peels off. There seemed to be only one coat of paint and no primer. The original finish was still on it as well. Since it had been painted, I knew that I had to completely remove the finish. The latex would not have made a good base for the chalk paint that I planned to use on this table. Since it had so much carved trim on it, I thought it would be easier to use stripper instead of sanding it to remove the finish. I used a putty knife to remove most of the stickers, but even then a little residue was left that I knew would be removed easily by the stripper. I ended up going over it three or four times with crud cutter until I was satisfied that it was clean enough. I then rinsed it with clear water and allowed it to dry overnight so it would be ready for stripping the next day. This is what it looked like after it was rinsed. I removed the hinges so I could strip the white paint off them and spray them gold to match the new knobs. I have this pet peeve about painted hinges. I always remove the hinges when I refinish furniture. Maybe it's because I hate to clean the paint off them. I place the hinges and all screws in a Ziploc bag to keep everything together. I was now ready to strip off the paint and old finish. In preparation, I wore safety goggles, two layers of nitrile gloves on each hand, and a proper fitting respirator with cartridges that protect against exposure to chemicals. I used a chip brush to generously apply quick strip to one side of the table. I produced a video comparing quick strip with two other strippers that you might find helpful. I also reviewed the hazards of strippers on that video, so I suggest you watch it before you use any stripper. They pose risks to your health and you need to be aware of those risks prior to use. As you can see, I applied the stripper and let it sit until the finish was soft. This occurred within about 10 minutes. Then, using a flexible putty knife, I scraped off the stripper. I removed as much as possible with the knife and then used a coarse steel wool pad with additional stripper to further loosen any finish. The last step was to wipe off all of the remaining finish and stripper with a paper towel. I did not clean the area with mineral spirits because there was only a minimal amount of finish left on the top. The wood was still wet from the stripper, so I knew it, it would be a lot easier to remove the last of the finish if I immediately gave it a second coat of stripper. This second coat only needed to remain on for about five minutes. I used a coarse steel wool pad to scrub off the rest of the stripper, as well as a small wire brush to get into the corners and the trim. I wiped off all the remaining stripper and finish with paper towels and then immediately cleaned off the last of the stripper with mineral spirits using a fresh coarse steel wool pad. Every bit of the finish was off. The quick strip did a great job. <laughs> this is a fun video. I sped up the video. Can you see the stripper affecting the paint? Look at it crack like alligator skin. The entire table and doors were stripped in the same way. I did not strip the inside of the cabinet because it had the original stain finish and it was smooth. I knew I could just scuff sand it a little, spray it with an oil-based primer, and it would be ready for chalk paint. 
This table was made of oak, which is a hardwood, so I used 180 grit sandpaper to sand off any remaining finish and ensure that it was smooth to the touch. I hand sanded along the edges and then used my mouse sander to sand the flat areas inside the cabinet and the top. I filled in the decorative grooved area on the top because after all the stripping, the edges were no longer crisp and sharp. They looked a little ragged, so I used my favorite DAP wood filler to fill in this grooved area. After the first coat was dry, I sanded it, but it still was not smooth to the touch, so I applied a second coat. This time I sanded it smooth. I had an even surface across the top. I almost always apply two coats of wood filler to fill in the carving on furniture. I have a video showing this process in detail. I'll put a link to it at the end of this video. The wood filler you use to fill in carving is very important and after testing about 10 different kinds, I now only use DAP Platinum Patch Wood Filler. It works great. Do you see this darker area to the left? This area has a thick coat of wood filler on it, so it's not the wood peeking through. That is bleed through. The tannins from the wood are bleeding through the wood filler. Oak is notorious for bleed through. Since I was going to ultimately paint this white, there's a good chance that I would get bleed through to the white paint. That would ruin my finish. Therefore, I used an oil-based primer on the cabinet inside and out. I used a spray primer because it dries quickly, but most importantly, it provides a smooth finish. Only one coat was needed because I got good coverage with this primer. When it was dry, I used a piece of crumpled up craft paper to sand off any dust nubs that were embedded in the surface of the primer. I then dusted the surface with a damp cloth to remove the sanding dust just before I painted it. It is now ready to be painted. I used Waverly chalk paint in the color plaster. This chalk paint is very thick, so I thinned it with water. As I brushed it on, if I felt the synthetic brush dragging across the surface, I sprayed it with additional water using a mister. This helps the paint to self-level and provides a very smooth finish that resembles a sprayed finish. I painted on a second coat when the first coat was dry. After I completed the last and final coat, I let the paint dry overnight because I wanted to ensure that it was cured. Since I already had my spray gun loaded with water-based polyurethane for another piece I was refinishing, I sprayed on the finish. You can also brush on the water-based poly. You may have seen me use a car washing sponge to apply the sealer. That is my preferred method if I don't spray it. The sponge applies a thin coat that dries quickly but you do have to apply three to five coats of poly if you use a sponge. That's not a problem because it goes on so quickly with the sponge and it dries fast. If you don't allow the chalk paint to cure about 24 hours, when you, then when you apply the water-based poly with a sponge or brush, the chalk paint will reactivate and you can literally wipe off the paint as you put on the poly. However, once the paint is fully cured, it will not come off unless you use a paint stripper. Most chalk paint companies recommend allowing it to cure for three full days, but I have found that I can get by with a 24-hour cure or dry time for most chalk paints. I am now ready for my big reveal. I have said nothing up until now in this video, so I'm really excited to show you how I'm going to make this lowly little table look fantastic. I am going to apply genuine mother of pearl tile. I purchased the mother of pearl tile on Amazon in 12 by 12 inch sheets. The thin rectangular slivers of pearl pieces are glued to a netting just like regular tile. The challenge for me was to try to figure out how to cut them. I found on the internet that some people recommend using a utility knife or a tile cutting saw and I knew the utility knife was not strong enough to cut through each individual piece of mother of pearl tile and the tile saw would just break them into pieces because its blade is too thick. So I thought I would try using my Dremel with a diamond tipped cutting wheel to cut the pieces of tile. Since the cutting blade on the Dremel is very thin, I thought I would be able to cut the thin pieces of mother of pearl without damaging them. As you can see, the Dremel worked perfectly to cut the mother of pearl. I marked a straight line with masking tape and then used that as a straight edge to cut the tile. I wore protective goggles and a mask. My friend walked in the workshop while I was cutting them and he said it smelled and sounded like a dentist's office. 
The sheets of mother of pearl were carefully cut to size and then I used weld bond to glue them to the cabinet. Just for good measure, I applied weight evenly across the top of the tile to ensure a good bond. I left the weight on for at least two hours. I used weld bond because it dries clear and I thought that if I used traditional mastic since it's so thick it would ooze up between the joints. The pieces of tile were so thin you could almost see through them. I found that the weld bond was the perfect choice. None of the tiles fell off and the grout joints were clean so it would be easy to fill them with grout. I had to cut a little piece of the bottom of the second piece of tile that I applied to each side but this was very easy to do with the Dremel. I let the tile sit overnight to ensure a good bond between the tile and the cabinet. It was now ready to be grouted. I used non-sanded grout because I was concerned that the sanded grout would scratch the mother of pearl. I mixed up the grout by adding some Waverly chalk paint to the dry grout. I did this to tent it so it would match the color of the cabinet. I added about one tablespoon of the thick Waverly chalk paint to about one half cup of the dry grout. I then added a little water until it was the thickness of pancake batter. I later realized that this was way too thick. When I thinned it to the thickness of latex paint, it went on so much more easily. I used a car washing sponge to force the grout between the tile pieces. After 30 minutes, I used a large sponge wet with clean water to wipe off the excess grout. I went over it several times with fresh water to remove as much of the grout as possible on the top of the tile. Since these tile pieces are not flat, I worked the sponge into the irregular shaped areas of the mother of pearl to remove the excess grout that remained on the face of the tile. I'm going to show you the video of the steps that I just described. If you don't feel the need to see this to better understand how to grout tile, then just fast forward through this. I think there may be some viewers though that find this helpful, so I'm going to include it here. I let the grout dry overnight. When I returned, I found that there were some areas where the grout didn't completely fill in the space between the tile. So I mixed up more tinted grout and re-grouted these areas. After 30 minutes, I used a clean sponge with fresh water and wiped off the grout haze. I did this two to three more times, ending with wiping it dry with dry paper towel. I then found that polishing them with a brown craft paper bag that had been crumpled up removed the final bits of haze and brought a beautiful luster to the mother of pearl tile. I recycled these two drawer knobs from a prior makeover and I thought they would be perfect for this occasional table. As you can see, they're very corroded and filthy. I placed them in a pan filled with full strength white vinegar and brought it to a boil. Once it started boiling, I removed the first one and I began to polish it with fine steel wool. I used a wire brush made with soft wire bristles to get into the cracks. It shined like new. I repeated this process with the other drawer knob as well as the back plates. When they were dry, I sprayed them with a coat of lacquer to keep them from turning dark again. The existing hole in the door was large enough to accommodate the new drawer pull. However, I had to get a longer screw. I knew I was going to have to drill a hole in the mother of pearl, so I purchased a carbide bit 
for my Dremel to drill the hole. I decided to test it to make certain it would work, so I drilled a hole in a piece of scrap wood and glued some tile over that hole. <laughs> then I used a carbide drill bit to drill the hole through the tile. It worked perfectly. So I was all set to drill the hole for the drawer pole for the finished doors. Well, for some unknown reason, I thought it would be a good idea to drill the hole from the back. In other words, through the hole where the screw is to be inserted. Unfortunately, I did not take into consideration the fact that the drill bit was not long enough to go all the way through. As you can see in the video, the drill bit promptly broke. Great! I only had one drill bit and wanted to get this project done, so I had to go to plan B. Since there was a back plate, I realized that it would cover the tile around the hole, so I just pulled up the existing tile in that area and cut that one piece of tile in half. It was repositioned to leave the hole open and glued in place. The back plate covered the area that had no tile on it. As my husband, the computer wizard, would say, I found a workaround. With the drawer poles now installed on the doors, I sprayed the hinges gold. I then installed them on the finished doors. I then installed the door onto the cabinet. Since the screws were a darker color, I painted them with gold rub and buff. The last thing I had to do was install the legs. I purchased six six inch gold chrome legs because the cabinet was six sided. When I flipped it upside down, I found the legs overlapped, so I used a four inch angle grinder with a cutting wheel to cut off three inches from each of the supports. I wasn't able to videotape that because I was concerned that the sparks would damage the lens on my camera. I used some leftover wood to cut bases for each leg with the miter saw. These bases were glued with wood glue and then screwed in place. The legs were then attached to these wood bases with one inch screws. The legs on this occasional table was finished. Wow, did it undergo a complete restyling. Remember what it looked like when I started? Now look at it. Installing the mother of pearl tile made this little table look glamorous. Can you imagine a dresser with mother of pearl fronts? I wonder if someone entering my IKEA dresser challenge will do that to the dresser they enter. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. That helps my channel a lot because it tells YouTube that this video is of value and others would benefit too. If you become a subscriber and click the notification bell, you'll be notified when I post my weekly videos. I always respond to comments, so if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I am really very, very grateful for all the viewers for your support and encouragement shown through your comments, likes, and subscriptions. Thank you very much. On the right, you'll see several videos that provide additional information about how to refinish, restore, and restyle furniture so you can flip it for a profit or refinish it for your personal use. Thank you for watching. I saw you from across the room. When our eyes met, I never knew that I could feel this way.